October 12th. And let's just get into it. Um, I got two things I want to talk about if you read the title. First one is the big matchup today between Arthur Betterbiev and Dmitry Bivol out in, I believe it's called Kingdom Arena in Ryder in Saudi Arabia. Look, the, um, look, they, they want the fights to, to, to happen. They're making them happen. This is going to be the fight of the decade. If you thought it was um, Earl Spence and Terrence Crawford, no, it's this one. This is the fight of the decade. These are two monsters, two beasts. Many people know uh, Dimitri Bivol for beating Canelo Alvarez in their mega matchup. And then those that are in the know know how much of a freight train Arthur better BF is. So I'll talk about that, and then I'm going to get into the Phillies and what I believe is a fundamental flaw in their philosophy. I believe that until they change that, they're going to keep getting the same or similar results. So without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about this boxing matchup, because um, I want to get the, the video out for this. So look, you have two guys that have been on a collision course for each other since their amateur days and even earlier. Um, they're both, they've both met before as, uh, you know way back in the day in, in Russia, uh, they, were, they were in the same circle and <clears throat> they, they've kind of tracked each other's careers, um, I guess, subconsciously. They, they, they know of each other, but they're, they're headed to the top almost in like a parallel fashion. And now they're meeting at the top for all four belts. Better BF has three of the belts at 175 and then Bivol has the, the last belt at 175. That's the one that Canelo tried to take. And you have two guys that I believe are still at the top of their game, but there's a few different details that I think make this fight more interesting than I originally anticipated. So you have Arthur Better BF, straight up monster, um, 20 wins, no losses, all 20 of his wins by knockout. There isn't another champion that is doing that. I don't know if there's another champion that's ever done that, had a 100% KO rate. That's insane. 39 years old, 5'11 and a half, 73 inch reach, fighting out the orthodox stance, going against Dimitri Bivol. 23 wins, also zero losses. Um, his not his not, uh, KO percentage is I think 52 percent or something like that. Um, I don't know what the number is for for knockout wins, but it's around 52 percent. Uh, 33 years old, stands six foot, 72 inch reach, and he also fights out the orthodox stance. And then, so you you go ahead and look at these guys' last six fights, and it gives you it starts to give you a, a an insight into what um what they look like now and why they look like the fighters they are now in the present. So you look at the last six fights for Dimitri Bivol, uh, Malik Zanad. He was a fill in. I forgot who got injured, but he was a fill in for that opponent. TKO stopped the dude. Uh, completely just steamrolled over him. Um, oh yeah, I'm tripping because the uh, the fight got postponed with Arthur Better Bev. So Arthur Better Bev had a torn meniscus in his knee, and he had to get surgery, and he postponed the fight, which was originally supposed to be on June 1st, and now they're having it on October 12th. And I'm going to circle back to that in a second. And then you look at the other five opponents for Bivol in his recent six: Lyndon Arthur, Gilberto Ramirez. That was a very very good fight. That's the one that I covered, and I did a. I, I did a, uh, I don't know, know if I did a prediction video, but I certainly did a post-fight reaction video. Um, so that was a good win. Uh, people uh, forgot how good Ramirez was. Uh, Zerto was a real one, still is. Uh, Canelo Alvarez beat him the fight before that, and then he had Umar Salamov and Craig Richards. So, like, and when you look at B-Ball, he tends to fight up or down to his opponent's level. So if the opponent's... Uh, a real one, he's going to raise his game. He's really going to step on the gas and show you exactly what tools he has in the, in the tool shed to pick you apart with. And then when when a guy isn't really that good at times, he can turn uh, the, the exact other way and have a, an average to very mundane type of performance. And <clears throat> you, you expect him not to have that any letdowns or setbacks um, in his training or letdowns in the ring against a guy like Better BF because he knows what he knows him from before, so he he knows damn well what he's about and what's coming and what he needs to bring to match try to match him. And then you look at Better BF, and I look at his last six fights, and he's he's had 
stiffer competition, and I, I think that is is um is kept him active in a way that he he's seen more firepower, and and, and more more high level opponents, um, with different styles and, and skill levels, um, you know obviously they're above a B fighter, but you know within that range of of B plus to to A fighter, he he's seen a couple guys so. Uh, obviously, Vazdik back in 2019, you're talking about an A plus level fighter. He had a belt at uh, light heavyweight, and he took that belt from Vazdik. Vazdik was the guy. He was undefeated. He, like he, he was one of them. He was one of them. I'm telling you, he was really one of them. People think that Sergey Kovalev was really the boogeyman at 175. Nah, it was Vazdik. If anybody goes back in their memory banks, if they were around that time, and remember, Vazdik was really the the technician and uh, better be have not only beat him but he stopped him. Vazdik was having some pretty good success early on in the fight, and obviously better be have had his spots here and there. But Vazdik looked like he was using the jab and and, and kind of keeping control of the pace and the distance for the first I'd say six to seven rounds, and then after that, like he hit him with with some hard shots, and then you just seen the fight turn just instantly. That's the type of power that this guy has. He has. He has the type of power to make you not want to continue. He'll make you question whether you really want to continue this fight. And then you look at one of his other opponents after that, you know, Adam Dianis, but then Marcus Brown in uh, December of 2021. And you look at what he was able to, to do to him. Former Olympian, a guy that was undefeated at that time, I believe, and a uh, pretty slick fighter, good speed. Like, you know, he, he made a couple people have the noodle legs when he when he hit him in his pre previous fights. Like, he he's – and he's tough, man. Like, tough, man. Tough as granite. And he he um, he um got cut in the fight – in his fight before Better Biev and found a way to win the fight. And then, ironically, in his fight with Better Biev, he – um, cut Better Biev during a clash of heads, and Better Biev got cut right in the middle of his dang forehead, and he was just leaking. He was leaking. He was leaking, man. It was really bad, and he just pushed through. And if you notice, go look up those that fight and look at those highlights. And every time he took a shot, he never lost focus. I'm talking about Better Biev. He just stayed locked in like the Terminator, you know, like he and he just keeps. Almost like Triple G, like they, they keep walking forward and they see if you're really about that life. And he eventually was able to walk through Marcus Brown, who is a hell of a fighter. And if you're able to, to, to do that, like who, come on now. So that was Marcus Brown. And then after that, he beat Joe Smith Jr. for his belt. Joe Smith Jr., one of the hardest punchers at that weight class. He's the one that um, he beat um, Bernard Hopkins. And um, he, he has a... He has a very, very long reach, 76-inch reach, which is, um, what, 6'4". He has a 6'4 reach. Um, at, at any weight class, that's that's tough, man. Like, to think, for, for reference, Tommy Hearns had a 70... Tommy Hearns and, and Muhammad Ali had a 78-inch reach, and they were very, very hard to deal with. Like, imagine having that reach when you're at one uh, under 200 pounds. That is certainly a big advantage. He was not able to land his power, and better be have didn't just beat him. He got him up out of there in two rounds. I remember that fight, man. Like, it, I remember thinking, and I remember the announcer saying, this fight is going to be determined by who can land the first shot. And better be have landed the first shot, and it was, excuse me, and it was a wrap after that, man. It was an absolute wrap. So, you know, you got him up out of there, and then he uh, stopped Anthony Yard after that, who was thought to be another like he like a young lion and he was able to stop him tko stoppage and then Kalen smith tko stoppage Kalen smith like six two six three like he's a giant and he made he he didn't from the second round on it was it was clear that he was going to get stopped you just didn't know what round it was going to be man but like he's strong enough to the point where he could just beat down on your arms and 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 make you question yourself so the competition on his resume is so much uh, higher than what I've seen outside of Canelo and Gilberto Ramirez. And Canelo, mind you, he was—he's a small, light heavyweight. He—he really—he walks around at 175, but he's just really not tall enough, nor does he have the reach to compete there. So him moving up to that weight class, though, it was a great win for B-Ball. 
I think we have to keep things in context. The Zerto win was more impressive to me because Zerto um, doesn't have great feet, but he has an, a hell of an offense. Defense gets sloppy, and that's why he got caught. He has a hell of an offense, and he's a big, strong puncher. He is, he's slow as molasses, but he is so strong, man. And um, look, the fact that he was able to really discourage him, um, that, that was the fight that stood out to me. But Zerto was not um, better BF. He doesn't have the feet that Better BF has. Better BF doesn't have as good feet of feet as B Ball, but he still has pretty good feet. And he doesn't have the snap or the punching power. So um think looking at that, I want to now circle back to the reason why Better uh B Ball had to fight Malik Zanat. Because, you know, Better BF had the injury. And this is my main concern going to this fight. And my pick will be interesting, but this is my concern. So he, the injury was announced on May 4th, and um, here, here's what I think is a realistic timeline for what he had to go through to be able to get ready for this fight. So usually maybe you, you might have to wait two or three weeks to get a surgery date, but if you're an athlete, you might be able to get scheduled sooner. So let's say he got his surgery on May 12th. And we're going to assume, best case scenario, it was only a partial tear, maybe the outer third of the meniscus. And um, there's different ways that the meniscus can get injured, but let's say it was a best case scenario, okay? So by May 16th, four days later, he should be able to put weight on that leg post-surgery. Um, and mind you, I'm actually referencing this from a paper. It's called Treatment, Return to Play, and Performance Following Meniscus Surgery by uh, Tamam, Hanna, uh, Nathan P. Smith, and Wayne J. Can't pronounce the rest of his name, but look up that. Uh, go ahead and look up that article in Current Reviews in Muscul Musculoskeletal Medicine 2022. And they're saying, despite these suggestions, I'm reading from this, there's no standardized rehabilitation protocol following partial meniscectomy. Now, around 0.6 weeks, about, I don't know, three or four days, you can put uh, full weight on the knee. And then around 3.8 weeks, that's when you um, uh, are doing active range of motion exercise uh, sizes, um, non-specific training exercises like the cycling that we've seen uh, Better BF doing. He put up a video on Twitter, or his trainer did, of him riding a bicycle as part of his rehab protocol. And that, that would be, um, so around 3.2 weeks is when they usually have you cycling and doing strength training. So that was about maybe a couple weeks after that time point. So he, he should have been well into um, riding the bike. So it's really not surprising that the trainer was able to put up that video. And then you go ahead and look at um, the rehab. Um, it, it takes around 8 to 12 weeks. And in the paper, they mentioned for athletes under 30 years old, it takes about 59 days or 8 weeks. And for athletes over 30 years old, it takes about 89 days or uh, 3 months. So 2 months compared to 3 months. And mind you, um, he's 40 and he's been through a lot of wars. So, that, so best case scenario, I'd say around... This the second or third week of July. Let's say let's say July twenty eighth. That would be the time frame. So the thirtieth, if it was two months out of June, and then the twenty eighth of July, if it was twelve weeks out from um, the surgery. Um, so let's say July twenty eighth, maybe that last week of July. He's he's really kind of wrapping up his rehab, and then he gets about thirteen days off before he starts a training camp which would go an average of about eight weeks, and that would end on October 5th, about seven days before fight night tonight. So to me, that's a really condensed schedule. That's a very aggressive training program, especially at at 40. Like he's not even 30 or 35 or even 37. Um, even if it was like two years ago, um, I would say maybe it would be a little bit different. But, you know, l listen, that's a lot of stress to be putting on your body with the rehab and then you get like this much time off to kind of relax and recover mentally and physically and then you're right back to grinding and then can you actually have a full grueling training camp which he tends to have or did he have to cut corners and cut back on certain parts so that's that's what we don't know and that's not a small deal it's not a small detail i know some people will try to downplay that or or um he said David Goggin. <laughs> it's funny as hell. Um, 
Uh, somebody else said that too. That's that's hilarious. Um, so I think the question will be: Did he have enough time to actually recover to be at least eighty percent? Like at least, or is is he just going into this saying this is the best I can be and uh, hope for the best? Um, I'm reading the comments right now, so um, shout out to y'all for coming in. Uh, Amos uh, says Bevo versus Better BF. Um, David Goggin live, bro. Uh, David Goggins commenting on boxing now. David Goggin looking young. It's funny. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a big deal going into this fight. Um, I remember going to the Sixers game last year um, during the playoff run. But you know, actually, right uh, the, the second to last game, I was over at the uh, at the uh, stadium wa watching the, the Sixers, and and B was just coming back from that torn meniscus, and. I remember watching him kind of labor at points. Like he was doing his thing. Like he's he's a great player, but he was laboring. And at one point, I don't know if he went up for a rebound or what it was, but he came down on that knee, and it looked like he he had really seriously re-injured it again. And I, I remember this guy sitting behind me. He was like, "Hey, you see him over there? He ain't right." I'm like. Yeah, I can see that. This guy behind me, he had had meniscus surgery, and he was telling me, he was like, man, at that point in my rehab, it was in no way I would be back to full range of motion actions. And mind you, Embiid came back in eight weeks, eight weeks at 7'2 and 300, well, 270 pounds. I mean, that's eight weeks is a short amount of time, and Embiid is around like 28 or uh, 29 or 30 years old. I mean, that... You're, you're asking a lot of your body, especially if you're going to be trying to chase Dimitri Bivol around the ring. Um, so that that's really what my question is. Let me know what you guys think, um, if you think it's going to be an issue or not. And then I'm going to go ahead and give you the breakdown of the skills, and then I'll give you my final prediction real quick. So I think the key is the victory for Dimitri Bivol. He's going to have to use that in and out motion, that pendulum step. For those of you that know, don't know what the pendulum step is, it's, it's a staple of the Soviet boxing style. I mean, a lot of boxers do it in different styles, you know, American style, British style, so on and so forth. But they are like masters of it. Anyway, it's another person who does it really, really well. Um, so that that in and out motion, and that's what got Canelo Alvarez um, using that jab and then being able to jump on better BF when he gets him off balance, which he does at times with his feet. And then the keys to victory for better BF, establish his own jab, be able to punch in between Bivol's punches. And that's gonna take having the time and getting his rhythm and being able to break Bivol's rhythm. Because if you can't break Bivol's rhythm, good luck. So you're gonna have to establish that jab. Uh, second is being able to cut off the ring. And that goes back to the knee. Will he be able to push off of it with the same confidence, the same power, the same burst? I, I'm, I'm hoping so. Um, I think that maybe he had just enough amount of time to really prepare for this fight. Maybe he didn't. But that's the second step. And then the third step, again, as I said with Bivol, if he's able to clip Bivol, he has to jump in and finish him off as he always does quickly. Because if he allows Bivol to hang around, Bivol is going to take him to a decision and get a victory that way. So those are the keys to victory for both guys. And then going down the, um, the attribute list, we're going to start with speed here. And speed here, I think, clearly goes to Dimitri Bivol. He's a naturally smaller guy. He has a piston-like jab, but he can flick it out in like a blink of an eye. It's like a blur. Um, Better BF has a, a really good jab of his own, but it's more of a power jab that's a little bit slower. And um, Bivol, he'll, he'll he'll come in with that pendulum step, and he has the quick feet. So you know, speed goes to Bivol. Uh, power obviously goes to Better BF. He, he has to be one of the strongest pound-for-pound -pound punchers that we've seen in a very, very long time. I mentioned Triple G as another one of those guys. Um, Deontay Wilder, I'm just talking about in terms for pound for pound power. He's up there with the Wilders and the Foremans and, and, and the Tysons. Like they, just, he doesn't look explosive when he's throwing the punches, but his hands are so heavy. It just takes two or three of them things to you know have you on the canvas and you just, you, you're, you're hearing the, the 10 count from the referee and you're wondering what the hell happened. Um, I forgot what fighter was saying um, that he got hit. I think, oh, Joe Smith Jr. Joe Smith Jr. said that he got hit with one of the punches that dropped him from better BF. And he said, my legs just short circuited. Like, I didn't even, like, feel, I didn't even, I didn't feel, I didn't even realize I was going down. Um, 
Uh, one of his sparring partners mentioned he got he hit him in his hip so hard that he his his foot hurt for about a week. So that's the type of power this dude brings. Like he and so he he doesn't have to put a lot of effort into his punches to throw them. So that's why he don't gas out either. Um, so power goes to better be uh, footwork. Um, uh, Dimitri Bivol clearly uh, defense. That's a push for me because um, better BF gets hit, hit a lot, but some of the shots he'll get hit with clean, but some of the shots he'll take a shot to land his own shot because he knows he's going to nuclear bomb you out of the ring. Um, Dimitri Bivol, he his defense is in his feet. So that pendulum step, that Soviet style moving in and out, that's his defense. And when he has get, been clipped, he, he's definitely, they've both been dropped. They've both been hurt. And, um, uh, Bivol, I don't know if he's been dropped, but better be has been dropped, but he's got right back up and then finished the fight. He KO'd, he KO'd the person that dropped him, like for context. So you, you have both of these guys defensively, they can be hit, but they have solid defense. So that, that's kind of a push to me. Um, stamina push they're, they, they both, they're both phenomenal in terms of the gas tank ring IQ push again, um, because you look at their pro amateur background even in addition to their, their pro background. And um, you look at Bivol, all the amateur fights he's had, all the fights he's had coming up in the pros, um, and you, you, all the different styles he's seen. And then better be the same thing. Like, he's seen all these different styles, like through the amateurs and through the pros. So I have that as a push for Ring IQ. Um, and then experience I have for better be Better be like... Um, Bivol has had experience, especially the Canelo fight, but better be have, he, he fought Alexander Usyk two times in the amateurs, and he hurt Usyk. He was fighting at 200 pounds. He was fighting, uh, I think that would be, still count as cruiserweight. Um, cruiserweight is one, what, 190, up to 200 or something like that. Um, either way, he, he was fighting at 200 with Alexander Usyk, and he was able to, you know, make him feel the power. So now he's coming back down to cruiserweight, and he's just, you know, jacking these guys up, man, because he's he's a naturally bigger person. Um, and he's he's fought every style in the amateurs, and he's seen that Soviet style from Bivol, like, countless times. Like, they're, they're fighting in the same circles. Like I said, they run in the same circles. And, dog, I'm not, I'm not showing the fight, man. Um, this is a prediction breakdown. Um, I'm not going to show the live fight. Um, but I'm giving a prediction here. So, I think that he's seen so many of these Soviet boxers that um, I don't think that Bivol is really going to surprise him in the ring when he gets in there. And then unless Bivol is able to um, really show him any different looks, like things he learned from the Canelo fight, it's, it's going to be advantage better BF. And then the X factor, um, I'm going to put this um, slightly to better BF. And the only reason I say slightly is because in terms of the X factor, without the knee injury, I think this is a very, very good fight. But I think that better BF stops him in the later rounds. If the knee isn't right, I think B-Ball is going to dance circles around him and it's going to get bad really, really fast. I'm going to lean towards the knee being good enough to go into this fight um, for what he needs to do because he doesn't need to be active and jumping on his feet all the time. He just needs to cut the ring off. But um, if that knee isn't right, um, it's, it's going to turn quick. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pick better BF by um, decision. Maybe he gets the stoppage. Um, I, I only see him stopping Bivol if Bivol uh, runs out of gas. But I, I think that uh, better BF by stoppage. Uh, let me know what you guys think. And um, if you're only here for the boxing, this is where you can exit because I'm about to flip over to the Phillies right now and how we screwed up that NL uh, DS versus, man, I can't even remember the team. I'm so damn angry, man. Um, look, this, this Philly squad, look, I think they have a fundamental flaw in philosophy, and this kind of ties into the boxing because you have better be of as the, I guess, brawler boxer. Like, he, he hasn't really be, been pushed enough to show his boxing skills, but he's super sharp. But he has that power to, to really stop you. And then you look at a B-ball who's a better technical boxer than um, better BF, and he's he's so damn sharp. Like he he can consistently land his offense. Like he stays active, and he can stay active with a better BF. 
So he never has moments where he gets caught clean often. Better BF, he'll, he doesn't get hit like a, like, like a bobblehead, but like he definitely gets hit more than he should. And um, if that knee is not right, it, it's going to be an issue. So like you look at the Phillies, they don't really have any guys that can hit for average outside of Bryce Harper. And my my philosophy, and, and I, I, I never understood why they just clung so tightly to this, to the death of them, starting Kyle Schwarber in the leadoff spot. Kyle Schwarber in the leadoff spot is like um, throwing your, your, um, your power hand early in the fight. And that's all you throw. You don't throw any jabs. Because Kyle Schwarber, he is all or nothing. He's either hitting a home run or he's striking out. Ain't no singles. Uh, he's home run or walking or striking out. Like there's no in between. And conversely, if you have a fighter like that, it, that that would be like the equivalent of a Jekyll and Hyde fighter. That works good against guys that are also not going to play chess with you. But guys that play chess, they're going to take you to deep waters and get you up out of there pretty quickly. A la Roly Romero and um, Tank Davis. Like Roly Romero has a right hand from hell. But like he has no jab. So at a certain point, your timing and your lack of defense and your lack of like understanding how to use the jab is just gonna is gonna haunt you. It's gonna cost you, and it did. So same thing with the Phillies. It's like if Kyle Schwarber ain't getting on base, if Kyle Schwarber ain't hitting a home run, he can't run, man. The dude has no knees. Look, no offense, Kyle Schwarber. Look, you know, but listen, he's not gonna be stealing any bags. And then in playoffs, every team is good. You're not running into one good pitcher every once in a while no every pitcher is above average at least and every team is scouting you out specifically for your weaknesses they're focusing on you not the all the other teams that they're playing this year not the two the two teams are going to be playing next week no they're focusing on you so they they're going to take away your aggressiveness they're going to use it against you and they're not going to throw you fastballs they're going to walk Kyle Schwarber and put him on base or not let him get a big hit and they're going to um, count on everybody else being overly aggressive and swinging at sliders and, and uh, pitches in the dirt. And that's exactly what happened. So, like, wh why not just flip-flop Trey Turner and Kyle Schwarber? Now you have a guy that's fast, that can get on base and hit for power, right? But if he gets on base, he's a demon. And now they have to pitch Kyle Schwarber, honestly. Because if they start throwing breaking balls and throw a wild pitch, uh, now all of a sudden Trey Turner's on third base. And then... Kyle Schwarber still, in in effect, can function as a leadoff hitter. And, and that's whether Trey Turner gets on base or not. If Trey Turner gets on base, you're able to get to RBI. If you don't get on base, hell, you're a leadoff hitter anyway. So what, what freaking difference does it make? So it's just the, the lack of strategy and understanding that, that really just kind of burned uh, – uh, just, just burned me to the core watching that series and really just watching this team down the stretch. Uh, you look at this Mets team – they are they swing the bat they hit the ball and they're patient man there's a reason why we were swinging at sliders in the dirt but when um ranger suarez was throwing curveballs and breaking pitches they went after some of them but for the most part they were just waiting on the first pitch they wanted to see what the arm slot looked like the release point the trajectory of the ball and then once they're able to be able to time things up and see like exactly what a curveball looks like coming out from your delivery or what your fastball looks like or what your sinker looks like now they're able to battle you better on the uh second and third uh strike pitch which the phillies just refuse to do so hey listen man you you play dumb games you win dumb prizes we go we can go back all the way to april or may and we can talk about how they asked topper hey are you got you know do you think you guys are too like home run heavy do, like, do you think you need to hit for average more and he was like oh no nah. um this slugger's going to slug. We, we, we just going to start hitting soon. And he did. But when you get to the playoffs, there's a difference between um, the 1985 Celtics, 1986 Celtics, and the uh, the Suns of the 2000s with um, Amari Stoudemire and Steve Nash under that uh, Stan, uh, Mike D'Antoni. During the season, they were running up and down the court with that four-court offense, just completely running people off the court. They were a lob city before a lob city was a thing with DeAndre Jordan and, and Blake Griffin and all them. But as soon as they got to the playoffs and teams were just game planning for them, those two guys in particular, and slowing down that, that team and, and forcing them to operate out of, out of, out of a half-court offense, game over. 
they couldn't do nothing and they, they got bounced out year after year because you have to be more well-rounded so despite having all the tools to get the job done and, and pretty much having like at least on paper one of the best offenses in all of uh baseball there's a reason why they struggled against certain teams especially in the playoffs not just this year but the year before with the diamondbacks and the nlcs and the year before with the astros in the world series once the astros started going to pitchers that had better breaking pitches and were able to locate them better it was over see uh lance mccullers jr he 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 couldn't locate he, he was just throwing his sinkers high and he got rocked that game but um uh the the Hispanic guy that they had the 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 Hispanic guy that they had um who won I'm not showing the fight it didn't happen yet the fight is at 6 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um but um there's a reason why the Phillies every year they they struggle with breaking pitches and Lance McCullers Jr. he didn't get them the first time but even though he should have but the rest of the pitchers they were on us man cuz we could not stop biting on pitches in the dirt and Alec, Alec Boehm, that year, struggled with the slider. 2023, struggled with the slider. 2024, we just seen the playoffs and then the regression on the defensive side. So, I think they need to, one, get rid of that um, leadoff hitter theory and really turn it into a tool to use against certain pitchers um, as opposed to making it their philosophy. Like, you might use it 10 times in a month versus 28 times in a month or 30 times in a month. Like, it should be situation-specific. Um, otherwise, um, you, you show people one trick enough times, they'll, they'll have an answer for it. And that's what happened to us the past three signos. So that's my rant on the Phillies. Um, let me know what you guys think about that. Any Philly fans in the chat? And for the boxing fans here... I cannot show the boxing match last time last time um i tried to show clips of a boxing match i got copyright uh flagged so you know try to find another stream and catch them before they get taken down by the zone okay um that being said i, I think that better bf will be able to pull this out but if the knee ain't right um you, you know what time it is uh with that being said i'm gonna up upload this on youtube go ahead and check out the rest of the videos and i'll catch you on the next one deuces